Thank you for having me out here. Before we start matches, just want to clear up a few things. So he, it leaves a lot of question marks, you know, when he said, okay, he went to prison in the shade. You know, I didn't always look like this, for example. I didn't always have a, you know, they call the Baza Takwa, the clothes of the righteous or the mama or these things. You know. I grew up in a really bad area in South Carolina. Small town, maybe 100,000 people in a small city, but they had a lot of uh, crime. In the late 90s, they were number eight in the country for murder rate. So they put all of the uh, projects, as you call them, or government housing on one side of town, and this is where I lived. And there were some places, even the police, they didn't like to go into those areas and things. So it was very dangerous. So growing up in this place, since I was nine or 10 years old, Every time I would go outside, all I see is crime. I see people getting stabbed, I see people getting shot, I see drugs, I see all types of things. Gangs, shootouts, all of it. My apartments were the only one that had a basketball court out of all, maybe there were about nine or ten uh, government housing. So ours had a basketball court. So it drew everyone to ours. So ours was like a main hub. And it was a, every time going out, you know, you're looking for how to grow up, how to guidance, all these things. So I look to the older kids. Everyone in my neighborhood, they're all in gangs and things like this. So I ended up living, you know, moving the wrong route and ended up getting uh, on another side of town, for example. There was some rival gang members and they tried to kill me that night. I was about 16 years old. This is not my first time running into my life was really hectic. I didn't really like living like that because when, you, when you're involved in that type of lifestyle, you're always looking over your shoulder, people always trying to do bad things to you. You never feel at ease, so you never feel safe. Continued 
studying and until I came home and got around the community and started Hausa and so on and so forth. So if you want to look it up, it's on YouTube. I don't know. Take all your time with that tonight. Okay. Salawala Muhammad wa Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ar-Rabbil al-Alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Muhammad wa ahda bayta al-Tayyamina ta'harim. Wa salatu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah says in the Holy Quran, in Surah 8, Ayah 70, O Prophet, tell the captives with you, if Allah finds anything good in your hearts, He will give you a better reward than that which was taken from you. And Allah will forgive you. Allah is all forgiven and all merciful. We see that in Islam, freedom is a fundamental principle. We often hear about people talking about human rights and all of these things these days. So we have to see what does Islam say, what are the Islamic teachings in regards to freedom and prisons in Islam. So, People during the time of the Prophet they were not detained like they are now, waiting conviction. They except when the individual's life was in danger. For example, someone committed a crime, and then a whole lot of people got angry with that guy, and they didn't even want to wait until the trial. They just wanted to angry mob come and kill that person because the criminal's life was in danger. So sort of like the witness protection or something like this. They take them somewhere safe and hold them. So it was very um, rare cases. And it's not like it is today where it's guilty and until proven innocent. They take you and put you in a county jail on an accusation and they hold you there sometimes for five years before you even go to court. You've seen some people, for example, I remember the, the guy's name was some Egyptian guy. They held him when that Patriot Act, Patriot Act came. I think he there for seven or ten years or some long time, and they just let them go. You know, sometimes uh, people wait and they do commit a crime, or maybe they go to trial, but it takes them four, five, six years to even go to the courtroom because the system is so backed up. But all this time they're just waiting there. Imagine if there are innocent people and then they're sitting there for five years just waiting. They're wasting their lives and. The system is ruining their life to hold them there that long. So, in Islam, they don't detain people except in rare circumstances. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, He relates that the Holy Prophet would hold the murder suspect for six days and he would give the people the time to bring evidence against him. If they couldn't bring the evidence within that time frame, then they would let the person go. It's not like today where they hold you for a long time, like I was saying. Also, Imam Ali salam, said, I do not apprehend on the basis of accusations, and I don't punish on the basis of suspicion, and I do not fight except those who fight against me. He said, there's no imprisonment for suspicion except in the case of murder. And imprisonment after the truth has become known of his innocence is oppression. So saying to imprison someone after you know that the truth has come out, it starts to become oppression on that person because they should be released. So they don't lock up people based on suspicion. Nowadays, anyone can just bring a suspicion on anybody and make it sound convincing enough and police to come arrest you, take you to jail, and God knows how long you have to wait in that. And while you're there, you end up losing your job, you end up, your family has problems, you're not earning money, you're uh, wasting time, your job finds out about it, you could be innocent, it's just an accusation. And then your whole life starts to swirl around because of this thing. So this is why um, the Imam says that he doesn't apprehend or hold people based on suspicion. And it goes along with the Quran in Surah Hujarat, Ayah 12, where Allah says, Believers, stay away from conjecture. Acting upon some conjecture may lead to sin. Do not spy on one another or do not backbite. 
So one of the companions came to Imam Ali salam, and he asked why he didn't imprison some people who were her, uh, accused of uh, insurgency or rising, wanting to rise up against the government. He said if he were to imprison everyone who was accused of this thing, then the prisons would be filled to the brim, they would be packed. She said, I don't find it in myself that I could attack or detain or punish them unless they openly wage war against me. And we see this in case of Ibn Mujam, the one who killed Imam Ali. He, he knew that he would kill him. Imam Ali knew this. He knew that he would, he would, he would be the one who would murder him, but he didn't arrest him anyway. Because how can you arrest someone who hasn't committed the crime yet? even though he knew maybe the person might change their mind or do something, he always gave the last benefit of the doubt. Imam Sadiq says about this, that when Imam Ali salam, was assassinated by Ibn Mujam, while on his deathbed, Imam Ali said, detain this prisoner, but feed him and treat him well while he's in detention. If I will live, I'll deal with him. And if I want, I'll seek some compensation from him. And if I want, I'll forgive him or reconcile with him. But if I die, it's up to you. If you decide to kill him, then don't mutilate his body, as some people do. He went on to recommend that his sons actually would pardon the person. He didn't want to abuse the prisoner, as we see nowadays when people arrest someone um, for example, let's say if we had a person who killed a police officer, imagine what those police officers are going to do to that person when they get them out there in their turf and they're holding jail cells. They're going to beat them until, you know, you can't recognize them, torture them, do all sorts of stuff to them. So this happens a lot. This is, this is the same thing happens in the jail. Guys, they fight and they rise up against the correctional officers. It's okay that maybe they win and they beat that one guy, but eventually they're going to take you up front to the building in the solitary. They're going to get you and they're going to beat you. And then they're going to hold you. And then they're not going to let you call your family, your lawyer, or no, no medical attention. Just leave you somewhere until you heal and say, oh, I don't know. Nothing happened. I don't know what he's talking about. There's no proof. This is a form of torture. So we find in the books of Islam that imprisonment is highly discouraged in Islam, except in exceptional circumstances. And there is mentioned in the books of Fiqh, there is said that there is about 20 cases that which call for the imprisonment. And those are for those who commit crimes against uh, Islamic law, Sharia law, like divine law from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has a uh, do or has um, Islamic compensation or punishments for those crimes. And it's not for man-made laws. There's no imprisonment for the man-made laws. Because we have two types of, of laws, not to get off. So we have Hayat, which is this uh, divine punishment, something prescribed for certain uh, crimes. And then we have uh, Ta'aziyah, which is some other crimes that may not have punishments prescribed for them, but it's up to the judge. And these are like man-made laws. We can see, for example, here so in the States, some things are uh, man-made laws. It might be illegal to do something in one state, and then you cross the border in the next state, it's perfectly legal. So these are laws from, that require divine um, uh, compensations for them, because they're man-made laws. So he said uh, that there's no imprisonment from man-made laws, only these ones that 20 cases from uh, Fiqh and the Sharia, which there are too many to get into here. When researching this topic, it was very hard to find a lot of uh, information because not a lot of people have written about this, but I found three books that were extremely useful and they had happened to have been translated into English. I have an Arabic one and then I found them in English too. But uh, there's a late Sayyid who passed away maybe 2001, I think, I think in 2001 or 2007, I can't remember. It's uh, Amar Jataki, Sayyid Muhammad al-Shirazi. He wrote about one 
thousand books, or over a thousand books. So it had a book called The Rights of Prisoners in Islam. This is a book he wrote. It had another book, The Government of Islam, what the government would be like if it was established, Islamic government. And then another book was War, Peace, and Nonviolence. So these three books helped me find a lot of information about the thought of prisoners in Islam according to uh, the thought of the Sayyid from his research into the faith. And to keep him going, he said that there's no purpose-built prisons in Islam, for there is no precedent in building prisons at the time of the Prophet or his appointed successors. So we don't find that the Prophet or the Imams, anyone from Ahlul Bayt salam, they did not build build prisons to hold people like we do now. The prisons here are for profit mostly, and they have um, a profit. You make money, and it's an incentive to keep putting people in there, and it's not going to make any money. So a lot of times you see people get locked up under false accusations or for the wrong reasons. And he said that there was no purpose-built prisons with the exception of uh, emergency situations. And he said during the Islamic era, those who were sentenced to imprisonment were given to a member of the public to detain them. Actually, someone would volunteer, someone would hold them in an extra room, in a spare room at their house or something like this until their detention was over. So we see that things were a lot different than they are today. Imagine um, someone saying, oh, can you hold this criminal in your house? You know, you have, you, I know you got an extra room, so <laughs> you can hold them. We would never do that. The society was a lot different back then. If you find now, even in Arabian time, when we go there, we see the people, Iraqi people, they open their door and they come, come in my house, come in my house. They don't know you from anyone. Come in my house, I'll give you food rest, I'll, be, I'll wash your clothes, I'll do anything you want, just come, because the visitors of Imam Hussein Alayhi So they welcome them in their house. But our society is different when we see people walking down the road, we close our blinds and we lock our door. We don't want to be bothered with anybody, we don't know our neighbors, we don't, especially not going to welcome some random person off the street and say, come stay in my house, you know, come eat with me. It, it's not going to happen. So the time back then, when we talking about this, you have to think it was a lot different back then. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa So prisons cause a lot of difficulty to society as a whole. First thing, they cause economic harm to society because the prisoner isn't able to support his family. Also, he's not paying taxes. The taxes help the society help uh, fix rules and do all sorts of things. He's just sitting there, wasting his time, locked in some place, holding there until they release him. He's not being productive. He's not practicing whatever skill or trade that he knew, so eventually he'll end up forgetting it or losing it. There's also financial administrative costs to run these prisons, put guards in these prisons, put electricity in the prisons, water in the prison, all those people, to hold all those people there, costs a lot of money, you got to feed all those people, you have to, you know, give them at least the basic of their rights, you have to hire the guards, uh, I don't know how it is in every state, but in South Carolina it was about 28 to 30,000 per inmate, what they were spending, and imagine how many people you have, you know, it's thousands and thousands of people, so it's a, it causes economic harm to society. Also causes political harm because prisoners, they end up hating the society. They're, you know, they, they want to harm the same country and seek revenge because they feel like they were done wrong and they get radicalized. They say pre prison is the breeding ground for terrorism, to get new terrorists, because these people are upset. They're mad at the country, they're mad at society, they feel like they've been left, let down, everyone abandoned them, their family left them, their friends left them, everyone turned on them. What do they have to lose? And then they get angry and they say, oh, I got unjust, you know, sentence. 
because maybe, for example, they're from one race and they got um, a 30 year sentence and then the same crime which you carry the same amount of time on another race, they get 10 years or 5 years or maybe they get let go. So there's inequality in the sentencing system as well. Now a lot of people get a lot of time for same thing, someone else they might get off depending on who they know or whatever color their skin is, for example. So this is another harm. Then we have social, personal harm. Because a lot of these people are young and they go in, for example, like myself, 16 years old, all I had to grow up around was crime and violence and gangs in the prison. You see this every day. You see someone get stabbed, you see someone get killed, you see someone, people get raped, you see people get uh, burnt, all sorts of things, you know? Imagine waking up every day and you gotta come outside and then you see, you're sitting down watching TV Someone boils hot baby oil in the microwave, throws it on someone's face, and their whole face comes off. Seeing stuff like this, someone borrowing too much money where they can't pay it back, and you hear people get raped. You see people get stabbed. I standing there, someone gets stabbed in their face here. I see someone in the chest 17 times, in and out. I don't know how the guy lived, but they're standing on him, pulling it out, you know, stabbing him, and you hear it go through the bones. See this constantly, all these years, you know? It's uh, sort of like those people who go to war, you know? They go and they see a lot of stuff. It causes, uh, it can cause problems with some people if they don't know how to deal with it or don't know how to adapt to it. And if all they know is violence and they grow up in this way like this, it causes a whole generation that has a social harm. Because they don't know how to interact with people anymore. Maybe they're too harsh when they come home, or they, uh, you know, these people, they teach each other other crimes, they build a network, because through their suffering that they're going through, they get united on that suffering. And then they get out and they do other crimes and expand their criminal network, for example. So this is a, another type of harm. Also causes family harm, because it humiliates the family of the individual when they spread the crime that they did all over the news. They have to live with that and everyone's like, oh, you're the son or daughter of that person, you know, this person, your son or daughter did this crime and they bring it up every time. That person, the parent ends up getting known as, oh, they're the mother or the father of the one who killed so-and-so, you know. This causes problems in the family. It tears the families apart also because they grew up without, you know, the First, the husband and the wife are split, or the family gets split. The children are left without parents. They have to grow up on their own with no one to give them any guidance. The household loses income that they need to survive. And family experiences mental anguish and trauma from this type of thing. And it also leads to uh, infidelity, you know, in the relationships between the spouses and things get broken. So these are some of the harms that it causes society, but I want to take a look at how those people who broke the law during the time of the prophet and the imams, how were these people dealt with. So we have, uh, it says in the non-Islamic environment where the Islamic government is not fully established, for example, like in the West, we don't have Islamic government or anything like that. So. The Islamic or the Islamic political, economic, other systems are not instituted. The code of punishment defined by Islam may not be exercised. So we don't practice uh, the Islamic kudu or the punishments in the West or places where there's not an Islamic government. The offender, however, should be punished as seen fit by the judge. So they leave it in the hands of the judge to make some sort of punishment for him. But it's not the divine prescribed punishment. And a lot of uh, ulama are of the opinion that those who do cannot be carried out except by uh, Ma'asum, one of the Imams, have to carry out these punishment because they're infallible and they know the whole situation of the case and won't make a wrong judgment as one of us might make. So it said the indicator for an established Islamic system is not just by saying it, but its overwhelming majority of the Islamic system is put in place. They have 
politics, the economic, social affairs, contracts, trade, all of these are pra uh, practically implemented by the Islamic way. So one time a man came to Amir al-Mu'mineen and he said, I committed adultery. So, you know, purify me. You know, make this thing go away from me. I committed adultery. The Imam turned his face away from him. And he told the man to sit down. The Imam then turned to the people who were sitting around him and he said, Is any, is any of you incapable to shield upon himself just as Allah has concealed upon him? The man got up and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I committed adultery. Purify me. Told him again. Imam Ali says, what makes you say this? Imam's trying to give him a chance. He's trying to have him, you know, maybe something's going on with you. Just go sit over there. Don't bring this thing up. The man said, I'm seeking purification from this sin. So the Imam said, and what is better purification than repentance? So you shouldn't come publicize this thing you're doing. You should repent in your house. Imam Ali salam, turned to his companions to talk with them, and the man got up again and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I did adultery, purify me. He's like intense, forcing the Imam's hand. He's like, please just purify me from this thing. So, Imam Ali salam, said, do you not read the Qur'an? He said, yes. Imam said, read. The man read the Qur'an correctly. He asked the man if he knew what his obligations were towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of salah and zakah. He said yes. The Imam asked him a few questions to which he replied correctly. Imam then asked him, maybe you have some mental illness or something, or maybe you're sick or even you have a cold and you're not in your right mind. He said maybe you have an ache in your head or your body and you're not thinking straight. Or uh, maybe you have anxiety or something like this. The man replied, no, he didn't have any of this. So the Imam said to him, woe unto you, go away until we ask others about you to see your impression about you. Just as we interrogated you in public, for if you do not come back to us, we would not pursue you. So we hear a lot of times that, you know, Islam, oh, we have to... Uh, Thieves, they chop their hand and adultery, they stone them and all this stuff. But there's so many ways that it has to be proven that it's almost impossible to even prove it. For example, cutting the hand. It takes, I think, 19 conditions have to be met in order to be able to execute that punishment, which is almost impossible to have all of those things met. So there's some mercy in this. This is why the, even the Imam said he would not pursue these people. They didn't want to implement, you know, these punishments on people. But they were there to, um, you know, scare the people from doing these sorts of crimes. For example, if, uh, you know, if a, if a person wanted to steal, but it's a time of a famine, or he doesn't have any money, he steals food to eat, there's no punishment on him. If a woman's compelled to commit adultery, for some reason she's forced to, no punishment on her. If someone was even ignorant of the laws of Islam, they didn't know that this thing was forbidden to do, no punishment. There's a lot of these things that they wouldn't be punished for. Even underage people, mentally unstable people, not punished. So there needs to be, whenever someone does a crime, it has to be thoroughly examined at what led up to those crimes. And Unfortunately, in the West, it's not how it, we see like a totally different system. They just lock you up, put you in there, and convict you. It doesn't matter if you're young or old or what you did, why you did it. They just put you in there, throw away the key, for example. Well, one time in the, in the reign of the second caliph, we see that a woman came and confessed of adultery, for example. She said, uh, impose this penalty upon her. So, Omar said, go ahead, we're going to do this and let it, let it happen. So Imam Ali salam, was there and he told her, he told he was surprised and he said, inquire from this woman the conditions, like what, what happened, like why did you do the, why did this happen? So the woman explained that she was extremely thirsty. She was in the desert, she found a man in a tent and said, uh, you know, she asked him for water and he said, no, I'm going to, uh, only if you do this 
uh, or I'm actually with me, I'll give you water. If not, then go. She didn't want to do it, so she left and went away. And then after some time, it said that she was saying that her eyes were sinking in and she was feeling like she was about to die from thirst. And then she had to go back and then she ended up committing adultery. So Imam Ali salam, he said that it's in this compulsion which is mentioned in the verse, whoever is compelled by hunger without inclining willfully to sin, then surely Allah is forgiving the most merciful. He said, this woman is not guilty of this crime at all, and he had her released. So we see that one person, they just want to do the uh, punishment for adultery right away, without looking into the crime. So we see that the Imams showed us that we have to look at the reason why people steal, the reason why people do adultery, the reason why people murder, see what, what's going on, what's the underlying thing to try to correct this thing in the society. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi wa Imam Ali alayhi was asked by Ammar when they entered Basra, when he, how should we treat these people? What should we do with them? He said, we should treat them with open-handedness and kindness just as the Prophet did with the people of Mecca and the conquest of Mecca. So we shouldn't be harsh towards people treat them bad. Another time, someone named uh, Musa ibn Talha ibn Ubaidullah was taken prisoner on the, in the battle of Jamal. He said, I was in the prison of Ali and Basra when I heard someone calling, where is Musa son of Talha? So I said, in the Lillahi when Ali Rajiun, this is what the prisoner said, oh man, you know, the caliph of the time is coming, he's going to kill me, he's got me in the prison. And he said, the other people in the prison said, he's definitely going to kill you. But who are we talking about? It's like Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, the, you know, the pillar of justice. So he came out and he said, I'm at your service, Amir al-Mu'mineen. Imam Ali alayhi salam told him, say, astaghfirullah, seek forgiveness of Allah. The man, he said, I, I seek forgiveness of Allah and turn towards him in repentance. He said, he said this thing three times. Imam Ali salam told the, man, the guards to let him go, to leave. And he just advised him never to do whatever he did, don't do this thing again, which was uh, fighting against the caliph of his time. We also find that torture in Islam is also prohibited. Violence, solitary confinement, prohibiting prisoners from talking to their families, starving inmates. All these things are not acceptable. We see they happen all of the time in prisons. Um, they lock inmates in showers, for example. This has happened to me before. Lock in a shower where you can barely stand. You know, the small shower where you just have enough room to stand. But you can't bend down and stretch your legs. Where they lock you there for five, six, seven hours, they forget about you, leave you there for a whole 12 hour shift. You cannot stretch your, you're just standing. You can squat, but you cannot move your legs out. That's unbearable on your legs. But they lock you in this place and they close the door and leave you. And you can call and scream or whatever, and no one's going to come. And this is one way they torture people. They beat people, deny them medical attention. I've seen so many people die from medical, uh, you know, I guess they just leave them. They think they want to get out of their room. They're banging on the door, something's wrong, you know, on that. They end up, they're sick. They said, oh, you just want to get out of that room and come up, up to the front or, you know, get out and walk around or talk to somebody. And uh, they come around for, again for the count. They're dead, they had a heart attack, for example. I, I was at one place that had no air conditioner. So hot, South Carolina in August, you know, it was so hot. You see the, uh, the wavy lines that you see on the road and the inside of the building. It's like unbearable heat. And they have older people there, 70, 80 years old still, you know. And they same thing, oh, you want to go to the nursing station because they got air conditioning up there and sit in the air conditioning. Oh, I know what you're up to. Next time you come around, that heat stroke. And they feel bad about it, but they should have given them the medical attention. This is all sort of like a torture they do to people to punish them. 
they denied uh, beating them like I told you and to leave them there, don't let them make phone calls until they heal up. Or they have uh, actually been some places where sometimes you have some people who are really rebellious, you know, and it's for a good reason. Maybe they feel that they're being done unjust and they fight and they um, fight the police, for example, but they lose eventually and they get them there and they beat them. But sometimes it gets even worse. They put them in the solitary and they still give the police the hard time from there, throw things at them and do stuff. Some places, what they'll do is they'll come in the room and they'll get the, the inmate and they'll hang them from a sheet and hang them and make it look like suicide. This type of stuff happens. It's happened where, where, where I was at. So then they just call the family and said, oh, the guy committed suicide. So all these things are like a form of torture. And they, uh, Islam doesn't agree with any of these things. Some people might say, you know, like the, all the governments and things, they torture people overseas, waterboard and all this electrical stuff. And they say, oh, but we're getting out the secrets of the, uh, you know, to protect the government here and this. And they justify it. Some people say, if you can't use torture, then how are you going to get this uh, thing from them? But the reply to this is that sometimes things are better uh, left than to oppress someone and be, you know, imagine if you're oppressing them for no reason and they're not guilty and you're torturing them. And a lot of times they'll say anything they want just to get out of that torture. You know, so a torture should be exposed, you know, when it happens. Because this rises, uh, it awakens people, the illegitimacy of the government that's torturing, and then the people rise up about that. This is why a lot of people are afraid of Azadari, and when we remember the tragedies of Karbala, because it arises in something in us to rise up just as they rose up against the people in their time. And we always, we'll always remember the injustice of Yazid against Imam Hussein. A lot of things to talk about, but I'll try to be short on the time. There's a story about the methods of how people were um, used besides torture to find out some things. In Isfahan, they had a governorship, and said of the first name, put it to Islam, Muhammad Bakr al Shifti. And he tried to find out about this murder. That this murder that happened. He called a, a psychoanalyst and they examined the body and they did this thing. So what they decided to do was call all of the butchers together in the city and have them line up and then they turned the backs away from the governor and they started to, he said, oh you guys can go now, just walk. And then they began to walk out. He said, you, the murderer, where are you going? And one of the guys, he froze. So then they found out at this moment that this person uh, probably was the murderer. And afterwards they asked him how did they come to that conclusion. And he said when he examined the corpse, he noticed traces of the clothing that uh, were indicative of how the butcher wipes the knife after he slaughters the animal. The customary way of how they clean the knife, it was done in the same way. So then he knew that the murderer was uh, one of these butchers. So that's why he called all of these butchers here. And Imam Ali salam, says, an individual does not intend something unless it shows in the expressions of his face or the slips of his tongue. So this is how they, one of the ways that they caught the guys when they yelled at him, the one guy froze out of the lineup. Uh, another one was in the same uh, governorship was someone had, this lady had her Garden or like uh, like date palms and things like this that were stolen while she was away. So someone came and claimed them for themselves. So the guy said, it's mine, and he got a lot of witnesses to testify, and the lady was like, what can I do? Can't do anything. This guy's got witnesses and all this stuff. So the governor, he wrote it off and said, okay, he's got witnesses, we got to let him go. So then, to summarize, he called the guy back. He started asking him questions. How did you get this orchard? Uh, how much did you buy it for? He said, oh, I didn't buy it. And he said, okay, so who gave it to you? And so oh, no one gave it to me. 
they said, oh, did you inherit it from your father or somebody in your family? No, I didn't do that. So all of these, he kept asking him all of the questions until he got to the point that there was no possible way that this guy could have gotten this thing. He asked all the lawful ways you could obtain something in business, and he couldn't answer any of them. So then it became evident that the witnesses were false, and he gave the orchard back to the lady. So these are some ways that they used to do instead of torturing people. But the question comes, how should we help those people who are doing these crimes, for example? Okay, now we know some of the ways of prisons back in those days and how they would catch people and how they didn't torture people, for example. But how do, what do we do now for these people that are committing crimes? The prisoners, they still need to be given their respect like as human beings, not treated like animals that are in cages. They have to give all their rights of a free man, except the fact that they're confined in this place. They shouldn't be abused and things like they are now. They, they're entitled to all of their rights. So for education, for example, we have to educate these people because a lot of the crimes are committed out of ignorance. It said, prison managers and higher authority, authorities must consider prisoners as part of the society and not as an outcast from it. Therefore, prisoner must receive ethical and moral treatment and education as a person and as a responsible member of society. Arrangements must be made to ensure that a prisoner is appropriately received by the society when he's released. They have to make some sort of uh, plan for them when they come home, what are they going to do? As we have, we might think of prisons, we don't see them that much because uh, they're usually in some remote places, but there's a lot of them. Incarceration rate in the United States is highest in the whole world. They have, they only represent, America only represents 5% of the world's population, but one quarter of, but nearly one quarter of the entire world's inmates have been incarcerated in the United States. Prison population here now, 2.3 million. And most of these prisoners, they fall victim to the revolving door, what we call it. You keep going out and coming in and going out and coming in because they become repeat offenders because they don't have the proper tools to educate themselves properly while they're serving their sentences. Um, one of the things that we've done for the past four years uh, I started a nonprofit called Second Chance Books it's to help prisoners. We send uh, we've sent over six thousand books in the past four years. At least we're giving them the Islamic education. We have about eight hundred converts who are writing us from twenty two states. We send them books, and these books are about beliefs, ethics, uh, morality. Fit, try to give them well rounded for a good structure, you know. And they can use these books as tools for self-development and then also teach their friends and families when they come home and things like this, end up learning how to turn, change their bad habits into good ones. And this is what uh, I had to do while I was there. I had to use books and learn how to practice the religion um, because no one's trying to show you anything good. If you want it, you have to find it yourself. You have to make a prison like a university and not like a um, some holding place or some place that you just play cards and basketball and waste all your time. You have to use it in the right way. So we try to give them the tools that way they can produce better citizens, you know, come home, help their communities instead of tearing them down. So when we send these books to the prisoners, we tell them, write us back what you learned out of these books and then ask us questions. Well, then we have a team of scholars, for example, they answer the questions they have, and then when they write us back, we know they read this book, we see what kind of understanding, maybe they had something wrong, we clarify it, maybe they had it right, we try to help them grow, so we send them another book. And then they do the same thing, and it's back and forth, back and forth. And some of these people have been writing us for, you know, many years. This is one thing, education. Second thing, another thing is skills and trades. We have to teach them how to do things so when they come out. They have to learn a skill or a trade or learn tools that they can open their own businesses when they come home. Because uh, these, these corporations, they're not going to hire them because they have felony. 
As soon as you go for a job, you're going to say, no way. I ain't going to give you a chance. So what does that leave you to do? They reject the job application before they even see you. So, you know, they don't want to hear why or what or you're a risk. They don't want you. You have to do your own thing, some skill or some sort of business. We have to find some way to give these people food and shelter because, you know, they're continuously punished after coming home. They did their time. Now they come home, can't get a job. Uh, when they go for an apartment, they do background check. They can't, okay, now I can't even live anywhere, and now I can't get a job, and now I need food. And for example, someone has a drug offense in America. Um, it was implemented in the Clinton's time that uh, if you had a drug offense, you could no longer get any public housing assistance or any food stamps. So now these people can't even get, they need food, they can't get food. They need a house, they can't live anywhere. Uh, they need a job, they can't get a job. So what, what are we expecting to do if we're not going to help them when they come home? If nothing's set up, they're going to go right back to what they know. They're going to go right back to drugs or robbing people or whatever they were doing. And they get frustrated. So have to, they, society has to find some way to help them with that, not set them up to fail. I have to give them rehabilitation. You know, the, they have the, the judges and lawyers and assist, the whole system, they need to think about the inmate. When they put them there for however long, what's going to happen with that person when they get out? You know, we have to think about the future. What are they going to do? They have to contemplate, you know, um, an exit strategy for these people. Because if they don't, they're going to get in that revolving door again. Uh, I had a good friend of mine, very good friend I grew up with. Uh, I ended up running into him during that time. I was Muslim. He said uh, he, he was still gang man. He was a crip. So he came to my room one day. He said, oh, man, I know what you're doing. I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I was like, wow, you know, where did that come from, you know? And uh, he said, oh, I, I took my shahada too long time ago, but I'm not practicing really, and, and you know, I'm, I'm about to go home, and I know there's nothing waiting there for me. Family don't want me there, uh, I don't have anywhere to live, I don't have a job, all I know is selling drugs and robbing people. So I said, I know Islam, he said, I know Islam is the truth. And I know that, you know, there's one God, and Muhammad's a messenger, and all this, but he said, man, I gotta go back to what I know. I go home, because that's all I know, so that's what I'm going to do. And he said, maybe when I get old, when I get, I think we were maybe like, I don't know, early 20s at this time. And he said, oh, maybe when I get old, 40, you know, 40, he thought, you know, when you're 20, think 40s old. So he said, maybe when I get 40 or 50, I'll chill out and uh, mix a lot and do all the stuff I'm supposed to do. So he went home, stole someone's car, and another friend of mine, you know, and had two girls with them. Stole the car, robbed some people, got in a high-speed chase from the cops. Total the car. He died, two girls died, and the other guy, he lived. But he thought he was going to make it until he got older, you know? But he didn't think about, you know, he could die at any time. So a lot of people end up going back to those cycles. I've seen a lot of people I know, same thing. They go home with nowhere to go. So. Anyway, prisons nowadays, they don't care about rehabilitating people. They just put them in there, lock the door, throw away the key. They don't, they forget that they exist. It's not like in the time of Islam where they would try to help them and uh, provide for them and give them all of their rights as a human being. Prison is more like, if you think of prison now, it's more like a holding facility rather than rehabilitation center. They just hold you there 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and then they spit you out and say, there you go on your way, no help. And you've been gone for 30 years, you don't even know what. My friend had a life sentence. He just came home about a week ago. He ended up making parole. Uh, he's one of the ones that helped me and taught me. And he actually had saved my life at one point because uh, we had a lot of problems with radical Salafis and Wahhabis, and they tried to kill me a couple times. Another story, but he actually helped uh, save my life. And they tried to stab me while in Salah. And now he came home now, but after 30 years, imagine being gone for 30 years. You don't know what the cell phone, how to work the phone, the internet, all this stuff. You know, everything's done on an app. You're calling a 
taxi, you know, an app, an Uber, and they, they don't know what all this is. So they need a lot of help and patience. But people in there, they can't rely just on people to take care of them when they come home. They have to use the tools to try to help themselves too. You can't just re rely on someone to help you when you come home. And Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, those who strive for us, we will surely guide them in our ways. So Allah promises us that if we strive for Him, He will guide us and help us. And Allah is always with the doers of good. Surah 29, Ayah 69. I don't know if taking your time, but I'll just end with, it, with uh, this last point about the prisoners of the war. According to Islam, the prisoners of war, they're not supposed to be killed. Imam Sajjad said, if you take a prisoner and he's incapable of walking, listen to this, if a prisoner, you take a prisoner fighting against you in the battle and all that, and he can't walk, and you don't have some way to carry him there, like in a carriage or something like that, he said, he said, free him and let him go. And because uh, you don't know what the Imam will do in regard to him, he's telling his uh, people that they capture someone and they can't walk, let them go. He also said, if a prisoner accepts Islam, then his life will be spared and he'll become part of your group. He went from enemy to your brother in faith after this. This is how Islam is merciful to prisoners. Imam Sadiq salam, he said, the Messenger of Allah, when he wanted to set out and send out an army, he called them and he brought the army before him and he gave them some instructions. He said, go out in the name of Allah, by Allah, in the way of Allah, and according to the religion of the Messenger of Allah. He said, do not handcuff or tie up the prisoners of war. Do not mutilate the bodies, even the dead ones. Do not betray people. Don't kill elderly people, the women or children. Don't cut down even a single tree, except when you're forced to do so. And if any Muslim be of a high status or a lower status, doesn't matter whatever status he is, if, if one of these people gives a polytheist sanctuary, says you're secure with me, then his safety must be secured until he hears the words of Allah SWT. If he follows you, then he is your brother in religion. If he refuses, then give him his sanctuary and seek help of Allah regarding him. And then, it's so merciful of Rasulullah, they say that he's uh, conquered by sword and all of these, uh, they paint him out to be some uh, warmonger, but if you look at what he really said on how to treat the prisoners, as you see that he's a uh, rahmatul alameen, a mercy to the world. And as you remember, Arabaheen, we have to think about when we're talking about these prisoners and prisoners of war, we have to see that even the month of Muharram was uh, sacred for polytheists, and they honored this uh, month amongst them. They didn't kill anybody, and this is one of the sacred months. And what we have to look at, they, when it came to Imam Hussein they threw all of these things out the door, out the window. When he said that, don't mutilate the dead bodies, for example, we have to think, what did they do? How did they, if they're not supposed to treat prisoners of war like this, how did they treat the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? How did they treat Imam Hussein? If we're supposed to treat just general prisoners like this, how did they treat Imam Hussein? He said, don't mutilate the dead. Yet they put the head of Abu Abdullah on a spear. The same head that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi used to kiss. His body was trampled until all his bones were broke to pieces. Then they turned their eyes toward the women of Ahlul Bayt Rasulullah said, don't hurt women or children. Yet they came to the tents of Ahlul Bayt, the women, and they sent their tents on fire. They snatched the, they snatched the uh, tents and they snatched all of their belongings. Look how they treated the daughters of the Rasulullah. 
No one wants to see their own child hurting, not even a little bit of discomfort. But then they came and snatched the ears of Satana, causing her ears to bleed. There was someone present in Karbala named Humayn ibn Muslim. He narrates that he saw a young girl run with her dress on fire. Her ears were bleeding. Humayn ran after her and then he wiped the blood away and he asked Rukaya, she asked him, are you a Muslim? He said, yes. So she replied, can you show me the direction of Najaf? Why do you want to go to Najaf? She said, I want to go complain to my grandfather, Ali, how they killed my father. They had no more tents and they were forced to sleep outside with nothing to shelter them. Then the widow of Hur, she came to bring some food and water. When Zainab brought the water to Rukhaya, the three-year-old daughter of Imam Hussein, often referred to as Sakina, she was placed the water in front of her. She had been thirsty for so long. She didn't know that it came from her wife. So she brought the water and she asked, Did my uncle Abbas come back to me? Did he come back from the Farad? Did he finally bring water? No, Rukeya, but please drink this water. You're the youngest. Rukeya said, No, no, Ali Asgar is the youngest. She took the water bottle and ran toward Ali Asgar's body, crying, Ya Asgar, Ya Asgar. While we say no. Zainab was guarding the, the camp that night, and she noticed that Rukeya had become missing. She couldn't sleep that night. Where had she gone off to? Zainab walks to the body of, to the battlefield and she finds the body of her brother Abu Fadl Abbas. Oh brother, have you seen Rukeya? Then she proceeded towards the headless body of Imam Hussein, where she finds Rukeya asleep on the chest of Abu Abdullah, hugging her father like she used to do when he was alive. The next day, they were made to ride unsaddled camels, and Imam Sajjad alayhi salam was shackled with heavy chains and bruised his wrists and his ankles, and a metal collar was put around his neck that would eat into the flesh of the neck of the Imam. Sometimes he would faint due to the extreme conditions he faced, and the captors would whip him to the point where he would almost die. Once Zainab looked at Rukeya, she looked for her and she was nowhere to be seen. She must have fallen off of this camel. She asked Shimmer to let her go, for she, she wanted to go look for Rukeya. But what did Shimmer do? Shimmer hit her with the whip. Zainab kept pleading and he finally untied her. He threatened to flog Imam Zain al Abidin to death if she didn't come back. She ran some distance in the way and she had traveled and saw a lady kissing the cheeks of Rukeya, wiping away the tears of Rukeya. Rukeya told her about what happened. Zainab thanked her and the lady replied, You don't recognize me, Ya Zainab? It's your mother Fatima to Zahra. As we read in the Quran, we see that these that the ones who die in the way of Allah, we don't consider them dead, we consider them alive, but we do not know how, we do not perceive how they are alive. There's a narration in the hoof of Sayyid ibn Tawus that a man was seen some time after the tragedy of Karbala. He was at the Holy Kaaba weeping and begging Allah for forgiveness, but said he didn't think that he would be forgiven. A man saw him and said, Allah is all merciful. Surely he'll forgive you. The man who was crying came close, said, Come close so I can tell you my story. I was one of those 50 men who carried the sacred head of Imam Hussein to Sham. At night we pulled out the head. What did they do with the head of Imam Hussein? How they disrespected Ibar. They started drinking wine. And that night it started lightning. And they saw the gates of heaven open, and Adam and Nu, Ishaq, Ismail, and Prophet Muhammad all came down with the angel Jibra'il and all the other angels. They picked up the head of Imam Hussein and began embracing it, kissing it, and all began to weep and cry for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'un. as
صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم كن لوليك الحجة بن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه فهذه الساعة وفيها وفي كل ساعة وليا محافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكناه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين يا حسين يا حسين